my grandfathers and grandmothers were very engaged in history and telling stories and my family's always been connected with history of, of South Carolina and my father was an entomologist and had a family business in Spartanburg and so I went into entomology. I'd always had an interest in science and insects and things so I sort of went into that so I could go into business with him getting a master's and a PhD in entomology. Science is so inserted into history and history into science and religion, especially in South Carolina, the scientific research that went on with agricultural crops. You know, Abbeville, South Carolina was at one time the cotton research center for the nation in the antebellum times. Cotton seeds were developed there that were shipped all over the nation down through the cotton belt. Of course, you had the, the group up here in Pendleton that had come up from Charleston, founded the Pendleton Farmer Society. Their main purpose for the first, well, really until the college was founded, was agricultural research and demonstration. And so a lot of your planters, um, people who were uh, high-level historical figures and political figures in South Carolina also dabbled in science because they were first farmers. Uh, and they had to know the science. They had to know innovations in order to make profits on the farm. Our first report of a boll weevil in South Carolina was in 1917 on Defusky Island. They call it the Mexican boll weevil at the time. It had come up from Mexico. And from 1917 until around 1930, it completely devastated South Carolina's economy. An economy that had been pretty much a cotton monoculture was fairly well destroyed. And a lot of the great migration that took place uh, among blacks and whites during the early 20th century was, was because of the boll weevil, because the cotton crops were destroyed. Uh, there were also droughts that coincided with that that made it even worse. But because all they knew was farming, they had to go find jobs in factories and move away. So we had a lot of uh, people who had the great exodus out of South Carolina because of the boll weevil. And we really never recovered from the boll weevil in South Carolina. It did cause a diversification of crops, which was a good thing. Um, and we finally got the boll weevil eradicated in the 1980s, and we still have to this day a boll weevil eradication program that anybody who grows cotton has to pay an assessment um, for that trap and the monitoring of the crop because uh, it's one of those insects that we might not have it this year, but if you had a small pocket of it, it could be widespread two years from now and cause tremendous devastation. Uh, it was the worst, probably, invasive insect we ever had to the economy. The fire ant was another one that caused some major economic issues, primarily in agriculture because of its impact to farm equipment. Cattle farming, you can have you know, calves that are impacted by it. It impacted for a while the ground nesting birds, it impacted the nursery industry. Shipment of nursery stock have to be guaranteed to be free of fire ants in order to leave South Carolina. So um, yeah, those insect pests and also weed pests and pathogens that come in can be a, a tremendous hit to our economy. And that's what our division at Clemson, uh, Division of Regulatory Public Service Programs, our Department of Plant Industry tries to guard against those types of things, uh, keep them out, and then once they get here, try to help eradicate them. There is a forid fly, it's a little uh, parasitic fly, that actually will lay eggs in the fire ant's head, and the head capsule will pop off. So it kills them that way, but those are native to South America. They've tried to introduce those here, uh, and they have had some success in laboratory situations, but not a whole lot of success in the wild. Plant, pathogen, and insect invasive species, and even animals, are highly impactful to our native species. The plant species, for example, a lot of them have completely overtaken natural habitats. Kudzu, for example, that was brought in as an ornamental as early as the 1860s. People put it on their, on their porches for shade. Uh, the railroad started planting it on banks to prevent erosion and then the Soil Conservation Service in the 1930s and 40s planted it on fallow washed out farmland to control erosion and it's just gotten out and gone rampant. Privet hedge brought here in colonial times is terrible in the, the natural ecosystem. One of the more recent ones brought in is Bradford pear because it's grafted to the old calorie pear or spiny pear rootstock and so when it makes seed, those seed uh, generate the, the parent stock and it, it can cause some real bad problems uh, taking over fallow fields and, and so we've declared that an invasive species or South Carolina has now and are discouraging anyone from planting that, getting rid of the ones they have. And I think actually it will be illegal to sell Bradford pear in South Carolina, um, I think it's 2024, 2025, that goes into effect. 
Social history is the history that is concentrated with people's beliefs, people's activities, the way they lived, the way they dressed, what they ate, how they moved, why they moved, how they worshipped, which actually precipitated the wars that we had. Times change, but people don't. We have the same wants, desires, needs, uh, everything that our forebears did 10,000 years ago. You know, it's interesting in this state in South Carolina, we had the blending of so many cultures early on that, that impacted the people we are today. We still have that blending going on now, but I don't think the blending is as impactful culturally as it was in the early days. You had migration of the Scotch-Irish, English, the French. Of course, you've got a strong African influence, the Native American influence. Uh, you've got German influence. You've got Swiss influence. So all those cultures came together, and by the time you had that amalgamated culture, uh, right after the revolution, pretty much the South Carolina culture in general incorporated a lot of those individual foods, way, modes of dress, ways of farming, uh, beliefs to a large extent, um, superstitions. Um, you know, and to this very day, I mean, we have uh, white people who have uh, the same superstitions that were brought here by Africans from Africa in the, the 17th and 18th century. So our cultures have blended, our beliefs have blended. Different cultures came together and made us what we are today, both in our actions, our desires for certain foods, our language, the way we talk, uh, and all that. And also climate had a tremendous impact on uh, South Carolina as a colony uh, and as a state in South Carolina. And entomology works into that. Um, we had tremendous, tremendous uh, disease problems in the low country from mosquito-borne diseases. They didn't know they were mosquito-borne at the time, but things like yellow fever and malaria. Uh, mosquitoes are the most deadly creature that's ever inhabited the earth. They've killed more people than all the wars of, of humankind combined 10 times over. You know, in South Carolina, life expectancy in the early days was very short. Um, in the low country especially, and that's why the, the piazza we're sitting on now at Woodburn Plantation wouldn't have been here had it not been for malaria and yellow fever because the low country planters who could afford to leave Charleston and the, the lower areas in the summertime got their families out because there was such a, a high probability of death uh, if you stayed there through the summer, especially for the white settlers because um, malaria killed them left and right, whereas your Africans who came to Charleston had well, what was called a sickle cell trait. And if you had the sickle cell trait but didn't have sickle cell anemia, that gave you some resistance to malaria. And so oftentimes the, uh, the blacks who stayed in Charleston through the summer did not face as high a mortality as the whites, although yellow fever killed both equally. Um, and, and the slaves often fell victim of yellow fever more because they were in those swampy areas where the, the Aedes aegypti that, that transmitted it lived uh, most. But you know, the, the planters came here, they established these upcountry summering spots uh, by the early 1800s, and so a lot of our population in the upcountry is sort of a blend of those low country planters who came up here and summered, and they would stay here from oh, around the middle of April, 1st of May, up until October. And then you've got the migration of the Virginians who came down to South Carolina. A tremendous amount of our ancestors are Scotch-Irish Presbyterians that came down the Great Wagon Road from Pennsylvania, Virginia. So in Pendleton especially, in what's now Anderson County, you had a tremendous blending of those low country families and the up country or the Virginians who moved in here. And those families had been in Virginia uh, since the earliest days. Uh, my mother's ancestors in Spartanburg are descended from settlers of Jamestown in 1608. So. Um, my grandmother always said, as Southerners, we're descended from the oldest Americans because you have those Charlestonians that came there early on, the Cavaliers, and then you had the Virginians uh, who came down the, the wagon road and, and blended in the upcountry of South Carolina. And a lot of our culture is this, uh, sort of an amalgamation of that. Revolutionary War, uh, if it had not been for the hatred the Scots-Irish had for the, the English, we probably wouldn't have won that war because it's, it's a well-known fact that the revolution uh, essentially was one, the turning point of the revolution was in the back country of South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. Battles, especially Cowpens and Kings Mountain and some of the others, turned the British north. Of course, Charleston was held until 17, what, 1781. Uh, when they took it in 1780, they held it for a year, no, till 82. Um, but, you know, the low country uh, was different. They were more English. The up country was Scotch-Irish. Uh, those Scotch-Irish had, had learned how to hunt in a lot of cases. Um, for survival because they didn't have the the cattle of those in the low country so if they wanted meat they had to kill it so 
The Scotch-Irish were very, very good marksmen, and they didn't fight like gentlemen. You know, the, the British, the English would line up in a field, shoot at each other, fall back, another line would shoot, and you know, that's because the, the muskets they had were not very accurate. So you had to have this wall of lead coming toward the opposing troops. Well, the Scotch-Irish typically used rifles because they had to make every piece of lead and every ounce of powder count. It was hard to get powder up here. You had to go all the way to Charleston or Augusta. So when you shot a gun, you wanted to make sure that powder counted. So therefore, they were excellent marksmen. And so you get a group of these militia together, I like the militia led by Andrew Pickens and Francis Marion and some of the other militia generals. And those men knew how to hunt. They knew how to fight. Uh, and they did not fight like gentlemen. They hid behind trees and they picked off officers first. And so when you're fighting against a British trained force that is taught to always follow orders when you kill the officer, which was never done intentionally in battle by gentlemen, uh, but these scotch Irish would kill the officers and the, a lot of times the soldier would scatter like chickens. They didn't know what to do. And so those tactics, I think, helped us win the war in the backcountry, uh, much more than was being done on the coast. The way upcountry southerners talk is more derived from the Scots-Irish dialect than it is from the low country English dialect. And the, you know that blend of English and French, uh, the foods we prefer. Everybody ate salt pork. That's about the only thing you had in the back country to eat meat-wise unless you killed fresh meat. And so you know, that salt pork was a huge part of our diet. People in the upcountry didn't eat as much rice as those in the low country. We ate more grits, you know, the ground corn, because we could grow corn, we didn't grow rice here. It's hard to get rice to the upcountry, so you didn't have a lot of rice. The, that South Carolina rice culture didn't really come up this way until after the railroads, pretty much. Everything was based on cornmeals, hominy, grits, cornbread, and to some extent, still native Southerners, we love our grits and cornbread and, and all those things as well, corn fritters. There was not as much influence in the upcountry early on from African community as in the low country because we had pockets in the upcountry along the Savannah River moving up to Anderson from Abbeville as areas where you had some very large farms that had, um, or plantations, uh, on which slaves operated. But for the most part, the upcountry farmers, they were not a big slave culture. So you didn't have that interaction with the African culture until later on, sort of the end of the cotton era. And, you know, I, I do want to make one comment about the term plantation, and I, I must say this. Automatically, people now associate the term plantation with slavery, and that is that should not be the case at all. Uh, we have different places renaming themselves because they were such and such plantation. Now they have to be such and such farm or garden, like the Charleston Tea Garden. Well, it's because of the miseducation of a couple of generations of Americans. Plantation was a legal term used in land transactions. And you can see this in legal documents going all the way back almost to medieval England, where the English legal term for a tract of land upon which crops were planted was a plantation. So in the early days of America, it didn't matter whether you had five acres or 5,000 acres. If it was a piece of agricultural land, it was called a plantation. Now, most plantations did not have the first slave on them. Uh, most plantations up here were small dirt farms that the people operated themselves with their sons and daughters. But I mean, there are land documents in my family and parts of my family that did not own slaves where the land, as when it was transferred, was called a plantation, uh, any tract of land upon which something was planted. Um, so that, that is one term that throughout history has become a bit twisted from its original meaning. Now planter had a distinctive link to slavery because to be a planter, a person had to be the master of 20 or more male slaves above the age of 16. So I think people have confused the term planter versus farmer with plantation. You could be a farmer and own a plantation, but if you were a planter, you would have had a one or many plantations in the large. So, so I, that's something that has, has, we've had to deal with here at the Historic Foundation. This is Woodburn Farm, but Ashtabula was known as a plantation, but there are very few slaves that served on the plantations or worked on the plantations in the upcountry. What about the religious influence uh, of, on the upcountry, particularly over the years? Very, very strong Scotch-Irish Presbyterian influence above Columbia, especially early on in the pre-Revolutionary War days. Um, most of the settlers of the upcountry were Presbyterian. Uh, there were a few Baptists scattered in and about them. Really were no Methodists until John Wesley and those came through to Savannah and later like the 1790s after the Revolution. 
So most of, of our religious beliefs in the upcountry of South Carolina are derived from those early Scotch-Irish Presbyterian values. And even most people who became Baptist or Methodist later started out as Presbyterian. Uh, below Columbia, you had a lot of Anglican influence, the Church of England, which after the Revolution became Episcopalian. But you had your strong Anglican influence there. And also in the, what we call the Dutch Fork, you had a lot of German Lutheran. Uh, so, and then French Huguenot as well. French Huguenot were primarily in the low country areas of Charleston, but also up around Abbeville, New Bordeaux. Uh, there were French Huguenots that moved in fairly early. So you have that blending. The, the Huguenots were followers of Calvin, John Calvin. The Presbyterians, of course, were John Knox, but they were very close in belief. So most of your Huguenots, or Huguenot as they call them in France, eventually migrated to the Presbyterian faith. And you know, the Presbyterian faith early on emphasized a very Spartan lifestyle, very simple houses. Most of our backcountry settlers early on lived in two-room log houses with dirt floors. They might have owned 2,000 acres of land, but the houses were very simple. You didn't start seeing a lot of this real ornate, intricate, uh, architecture, big massive houses coming into place until that low country influence, early 1800s. Andrew Pickens is a good example of, of Scotch-Irish Presbyterian. He was very serious, he was very devout. He really had no time for what they call vainglories, which were things of ease, things of comfort. Uh, they didn't have time for that back then. They, they were just making a uh, existing from day to day in some cases. And they were very, had a very strong faith in God. Now they weren't big church attenders, because churches were few and far between. So these people were very faithful people, uh, but as far as attending regular church services in the back country, it was not available to them like it was in the low country. You know, they couldn't just get in a creek and go to church by the tides. Um, so, you know, sometimes you had a family that might not go to church but once a month when the traveling circuit riding preacher came around. And sometimes these ministers were Presbyterian ministers, but they would also teach in Baptist churches or Methodist churches or you know, wherever. Um, they might teach, preach in one church on Sunday and one on Monday and one on Tuesday, uh, but the people were hungry for the Word of God. That doesn't mean that they were devoutly behaved. There were tremendous problems in the upcountry, the backcountry with alcoholism, um, fighting, um, gambling, every sin and vice that plagues people today we had during that time period. So they were very devout people. They had strong beliefs, but they fell victim to the same things. And you look back through church records and you see that the most prevalent thing that someone was churched for, or kicked out of church for, was partaking of strong drink and being drunk. So, um, like I said, people haven't changed. The same thing that plagued our ancestors are, are common in society today. And I think our conservative values and our, you know, our value for capitalism, our value for uh, independence, for personal freedom, for land rights, all that comes directly from our British, uh, Scottish, English, Irish, French uh, ancestors that came over, over in the 1700s. We are descended from the lineages that came here when America was first founded. And my grandmother said many times, our ancestors were not just immigrants, they were nation builders. And I think that attitude has come through a lot of families and you feel obligated because your ancestors were nation builders to carry on that tradition of success and building something during your lifetime that will outlast you. And family names were very important, what you had accomplished, what your grandfather had accomplished. You know, after the war between the states, everybody in the South pretty much was poor. You know, our families lost everything. Our ancestors were the victims of a federal government that came in and conquered them, but they were not victims long because that whole concept of victimization was not something that our ancestors believed counted for anything. You might have been a victim initially, but you took that and you made something out of it. And I think that perseverance, that um, stick to itiveness, and you can see this in South Carolinians after hurricanes, after tornadoes, after floods, we're going to pick up going and make a life again. We've got ourselves, we've got our religion, we've got our faith, we have our family, we can make it again. And I think that type of thing has been passed down to us from our ancestors who were bullheaded enough to leave oppression where they migrated from and found a new nation. We're heirs to that as Southerners. Not that Northerners aren't, but especially as Southerners, we're heirs to that feeling of we're obligated to make something of ourselves and of our, of our state.